oh, it put us both in the spotlight. How's that? There we go. All right. How are we going to do the questions from the kids? Are they going to feed the questions to you or will they be asking me directly? They can put it in chat. Um, I think that's probably the best way. And then if that, some of them are going to be comfortable talking loud and some are not comfortable, that's kind of the status of things this year. Um, so if they want to ask a question, they can raise their hand. Um, or do you guys have the hand raise feature back on, on Zoom? Our Zoom has been funky lately. Yes, Penny can raise her hand. Okay, so they can raise their hand in the chat or uh, in the participants tab, and then we can just call on them if they want to ask your, the question to themselves. Otherwise, they can type it in the chat. Um, okay. and, sorry. And your co host, they should be able to chat with you too. Yeah. You guys have anything to start with? that you want to ask? They've also only met one author so far this year. We had Scott Rankin on um, in the fall when we were doing dystopian book clubs. So he's the only other author they've met with so far this year. Well, I'm fairly typical. <laughs> I don't think you're typical. <laughs> That's not the word I would use to describe you. <laughs> I'm Lauren right. wants to know when you wrote your first book. Ah, uh, my first book. I don't know if it's going to show up because I have a green screen, but can you see it? This is my first book. I wrote oh. it when I was five. And I want to show you guys the best picture. Okay, you ready? This is my robot. He likes pipes. He loves Spanish rice. <laughs> I did this when I was five. This is my <laughs> first book. It's I illustrated it too. So it's just amazing. And it even has dialogue. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Is your punctuation yeah. correct on your dialogue? It's pretty good for a five-year-old. <laughs> it's pretty nice. good. Yeah. Yeah. It ends in a snowball fight. <laughs> with a robot? A snowball fight with a robot? No, he's not in the snowball fight. Here's oh. a picture of a teacher. See, everybody has a little desk. <laughs> and the teacher is saying, um, Mitchell and Herbert, stop talking. Herbert is his friend. <laughs> Can you see it? I love it. Yeah, this is just brilliant. It's just. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I was always writing books, even as a four year, a five year old. Um, <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty great. <laughs> <laughs> what was the first book you published? It's called um, Just Another Day in My Insanely Real Life, and it came out in 2006. Um, it was really the second book I wrote when I decided I wanted to see if I could get published, I sent a manuscript around and it was about um, kids playing a sort of Pokemon card game when Pokemon card games were all the rage. And um, it got some really nice rejection letters that made me think, huh, you know, I should keep going with this because they were very, very specific. You know, if you get like a form rejection letter that says, you know, dear Penny Guilford, thank you for sending me your book. Unfortunately, I can't publish it. Um, that doesn't really help you in any way. But if you get rejection letters that are really specific that say, you know, dear Penny, I really like this character and I wish that they were more about its other character and I was really interested in this element and wish that you had developed it a little bit more, that kind of thing is really valuable because it's you know it's specific feedback so i got several of those sorts of letters and i thought huh you know i might be on to something and i um i had this other manuscript and i developed it i turned it around and sent it around and it, that's what got published as my first book so i was pretty lucky i i didn't struggle for years and years the way some 
authors do until I got published, but it was pretty fast for me. Have you revisited that book? No, it's, it's, I, I've changed so much the way that I write and the topics that I write about that I, it really isn't really where I'm at these days. Um, you huh. know. Interesting. I still play Pokemon. Who? I, I play Pokemon. I play Pokemon on my phone. I play Pokemon Go. I've played it since it was released in 2016. Oh, a lot of people do. <laughs> yeah. But this was when people, you know, kids were playing the card right. game. Yeah. And, yeah, um, yeah. It was yeah my like, son was like way into it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I made up my own game that was more like a magic kind of card game. Um, you know, and the book was, the book had stuff in it that was good and other stuff that you know that's fun this wasn't there but anyway um yeah i i was really lucky i i i got published fairly quickly are you yeah, with the same I, publisher you've been with the whole time yeah this that's whole amazing. time i'm with simon and schuster <laughs> that's amazing yeah I've, I've been like one of those ball players who only play for one team their whole <laughs> career <laughs> Yeah. Dominic, you have a question? What was the uh, name of the book that you were wrote when you were five? It's called Mitchell Collapse because the main character's name was Mitchell Collapse and his best friend was Herbert. <laughs> they were very naughty. And um, actually, I'll show you one more page. They, they actually were so bad at school that they got sent home from school. <laughs> and then <laughs> and then um here here they are here's their um they're being greeted by the robot when they come back early from school and it says um okay wait it and then they say it was a room. short day of school let's go back yes we will so they go back to school and the teacher kicks them out <laughs> things that would never happen in real life <laughs> yeah um, it's great amanda amanda that's not a real i mean this someone asked her before the meeting really started what her first book she ever wrote was and she wrote that when she was five so it's not actually a book the books, it's not that, a book. the books that you can read are behind her on her green screen and she has more than that those are the five that i have most copies of i have like 18 copies of each of those books except my wow. life in the fish tank i'm waiting for that one to go on sale on first book so i can stock up because i want it next year for my social justice yeah. book club for sure it's a great one yeah. um catherine wanted to know which of your books is your favorite it's hard to say i mean i um usually it's like the book that you just finished writing because your your head is still in it you know and you have to really you have to dream about the book at night you have to think about it all day long even when you're not working on it and so it, it just becomes so much a part of you know your thought process that you have to fall in love with it or it's going to be a problem so you know i i am really proud of my life in the fish tank i felt like it captured a lot of stuff from my own family and um you know it's it's got a lot of humor in it and i like to always if i can have humor in these books that are about serious things so i and i i just really like the main character Sydney. so but you know i i the book that um I guess the two books that I'm proudest of are um, Maybe He Just Likes You because it's about a topic that had not been written about before. And a lot of, it, it's starting a lot of conversations that wouldn't have happened, I think, otherwise. And the other book that's like that is Starcrossed because when that book came out, it was the only book like it. So those two books were, you know, kind of revolutionary for middle grade. Um, those are the two I have kids reading right now. I have yeah. kids that are focused on feminism and also on the hashtag me too movement. And then I have yeah. other kids that are writing about LGBTQ stuff. And so they chose, those are two of the books that were on the list for them to choose from. So 
and halfway normal is a book that you know my son my oldest son had cancer a few years ago so that really directly inspired that book and um you know that book was also very emotional for me to write but um in a lot of ways my life in the fish tank is more about my family's experience with cancer than halfway normal is because with halfway normal it's about a different kind of cancer a different kid a different age a different gender um it's not really personal even though it was very much inspired by my son's experience my life in the fish tank is a more personal book in a lot of ways so i mean i have relationships with all these different books you know they, they just mean different things to me um so i so i can't really say which is my favorite yeah that's our question um dominic did you have another question yeah. are you writing a book right now oh i'm always writing a book i have a book that's coming out in september called violets are blue and i just showed everybody the cover of it um so oh, i so got pretty. a lot of it's beautiful cover oh, it's so and it's it this one is about a kid who is obsessed with special effects makeup videos on youtube um, the kind of special effects to make you into a character like an alien, a superhero, um, a mermaid, all different kinds of special effects techniques that there's this whole culture on YouTube of people who are showing you how to do that. And she's so obsessed with these YouTube videos that she doesn't realize that her mom is struggling with an addiction to painkillers. So in a way, the book is about like two different kinds of addictions. One is a healthy, creative one, and the other one is not. And it's about the way that these two characters collide eventually. Yeah. So that I'm very excited about that book. When and did you say it comes out in the fall? September. Okay. September. September 28th. Okay. It's called Violets Are Blue. And um I am right now writing a book um, about a kid who is obsessed with climate change. And that will come out the fall of 2022. Okay. So. I was just in a webinar yesterday with Alan Gratz and his, the book he's working on right now is involving climate change as well. Yeah. So well, it's a huge, it's an obsession for a lot of kids for good reason, mm -hmm. you know. So it is. this is about a kid who um, isn't just obsessed with it. She has what they call eco anxiety. She's upset about it. And it, she's, she's figuring out a way to channel that into something healthy, which in her case is uh, protesting about a local river that's polluted by um, chemicals. So yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm always looking for new topics. If any of you guys have any suggestions for new topics to write about, I'd love to hear them. Um, Penny wanted to know what encouraged you to be an author? Encouraged me? I, I don't know if I ever got encouraged to do it. It was just something I always did. I mean, you could see when I was a really little kid, I was doing it on my own. It wasn't like somebody was encouraging me. I just, this is just what I did, you know. Um, you know, like some people want to run and do athletics and throw a ball and other people want to play an instrument and other people want to draw. You know, there's just something inside you that just makes you do it. And, you know, it's not like somebody encouraged me. <laughs> Um, Camille wants to know how you decide what to write about. And I don't know, I don't know how many of your books, usually in the classroom, I have your books out there all the time. And I have kids reading your books always, like for every book club, I'm constantly, I have kids who read all your books. Like that's, that's what I normally do, but this year's weird. So I don't know yeah. how many of them have read your books. So I don't know if you guys know that one of the things that Barbara's really great at is that she takes these topics that aren't people that kids your age want to know about, but
but they can't, they can't find books about them that are for their age. It just doesn't happen. And Barbara writes those books. Like she's really good at that. So how do you, where does, where does that come from? Where do you get those ideas? That's, I think that's well, all, you know, all, all different places, like, um, with maybe he just likes you. Um, I was hearing a lot of stories about, you know, the hashtag me too movement. And I was, I was hearing about, um, stories of things going on in high school. And I thought, boy, you know, where does this stuff start? If it doesn't start in high school, where does it start? And I read a lot of articles um, by educational experts that said that it starts in middle school. So then I had a long um, interview with a middle school psychologist and she told me that um, she knows that this kind of stuff happens in middle school all the time, but she never sees it because it tends to happen when grownups aren't looking. And she said, um, when she hears about it, it's not usually that the kid who's being targeted comes to her and says, I am being tar I am being sexually harassed. Usually what happens is a group of her friends will come to the school psychologist and say, um, our friend is being harassed and we don't know what to do about it. Or they'll say, um, you know, a group of kids are having a fight. And when she sits them down and she says, you know, what's going on with you guys? You've always been friends. Why are you fighting? Often at the heart of the tension in the group is that one of the girls is being harassed and the other girls are confused about it or even jealous in a weird way or um, upset and they don't know how to handle it. And so she realizes that this kind of thing is going on. So when I heard that, I thought, you know, I could really write about this topic because I never like to come at a topic from just one angle. I like to come at it from different angles. And when I heard about the tensions in the group of friends, that just made, you know, wheels turn in my head. And I, I also was able to draw on my own experience in middle school a little bit because I remember how that felt. So I get ideas just from thinking about what I went through when I was in middle school. Um, as I said before, um, Halfway Normal came from my family's experience. My Life in the Fish Tank came from my family's experience. Star Cross came from how I felt when I was in middle school and I had a crush on my best friend who was a girl. And I also had crushes on boys and I didn't know what that meant. And I didn't know, you know who I could talk to about that stuff. Um, and everything I know about you, um, I had an eating disorder when I was in college. And when I read an article about how most of the people who are coming down with eating disorders these days are younger and often in middle school, I got very interested in that because that was something that I went through. Um, but I knew that it would be it would have been a different kind of experience to have gone through it when I was younger. So I um, I interviewed. Um, a therapist who works with kids um, middle school age who have eating disorders. So, I mean, my ideas come from all over the news, my own personal experience, my memories. You know, I'm always looking for topics and I'm always thinking, like, what's the book that I needed when I was in middle school? You know, what's the book that isn't on the shelf right now? Because, you know, that's what I feel like is my mission. Mm -hmm. I think I personally, I think that that's, that that's what I see in you <laughs> and what I see <laughs> in your books is nailing that. And, and the fact that you nail middle schoolers so well, like every time I read one of your books, I'm like, oh, I teach that kid. And oh, I teach that kid. And, oh, I teach that kid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> every time. <laughs> um, I think, I'm, yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to say, I feel like I'm stuck at age 12 or 13. <laughs> I just have a very strong sense of what that felt like. Yeah. Um, Lauren has a suggestion. I don't know if my Zoom is frozen. Uh oh. I can hear you. There I think you I think I was frozen. Was I frozen? For a second, yeah. Okay. Um, Lauren has a suggestion. She said, maybe you could write something from the view of a teacher who has to teach online because of COVID. And Penny 
wanted to know if you wanted to be an author at their age, what do they do? What do they do to get there? So. Oh, well, if you want to, if you want to be an author and you're in seventh grade right now. Yeah. Um, you know, when I was in seventh grade, I, I did want to be an author, um, but I also did other stuff. Um, I was a high school English teacher for a few years. I went to law school. I was a lawyer for a few years. Um, yeah, I didn't like it, but I, you know, I think, I think having different experiences is great. It's not like there's one path that you have to follow. And in fact, the more different paths that you follow, the better that makes your writing richer, the more different experiences you have. I would say if you're writing right now, the best thing to do, first of all, is to keep reading. You know, that's the most important thing. If you're going to be a writer, you have to be a reader. So read as much as you can and, you know, read in as many different genres as you can, different types of books, different authors. But if you find a kind of book that you really like, you know, read it and think, what do I like about this book? You know, what am I responding to? Why? You know, do I do I like a lot of dialogue? Why did the author use flashbacks? Why, you know, what what is it about the way that this author depicted this character that I am finding interesting? You know, read it like a writer. Mm -hmm. That's what notes. I tell them all the time. That's the line I use. Read like a writer. Read like a writer. Read like a writer, not like a reader, um, because you're you're learning as you're reading. And the other thing that I, I always tell, well, two other things. One is that when you write something, read it out loud. Close your door and read it out loud. Even if it's not like a story, even if it's like something you write for your science teacher, before you turn it in, read it out loud because your ear will pick up stuff that your eyes won't when you're just typing on looking at your computer screen. And if you're writing a story and you read it out loud, you will hear if the characters don't sound like they're talking naturally. You'll hear the dialogue and you'll be able to tell if it's good dialogue or not. And the other thing that I would say is if you write something, share it. It's very hard to develop as a writer if you just stick it in your desk and you feel shy about sharing it, or if you only share it with people who are gonna tell you, oh, this is great, this is the best thing. I love it, it's perfect. You wanna get that feedback Remember I said at the beginning that, you know, I got feedback when I was first starting out um, and it was precious because it, you know, it made me realize that I had talent, but also there was room for growth and that there were certain elements in my book that people were responding to and they wanted to see more of or less of. And if I hadn't um, used a lot of that feedback, I probably wouldn't have gotten published. So it's really important to get over feeling, you know, like you're being criticized or attacked if you're getting feedback. You have to get really comfortable with it. And you have to also be willing to revise a lot. <laughs> That's a big part of being a writer is being a reviser. So, you know, if you have the right attitude about all that stuff, you'll, you'll do it. Can you speak a little bit to that about the revision process? Like, oh, yeah. I mean, it's it's the main thing that you do as a writer. Uh, when you sit down and you write a book, it's just the first draft. And in fact, I tell kids sometimes when they say, how do you deal with writer's block? Because everybody has writer's block. Everybody has writer's block. What I say is that, you know, one way to get over writer's block is just to think, I am writing a draft. It doesn't have to be perfect the first time. In fact, it won't be perfect, <laughs> but I will have plenty of opportunity to revise it, you know, and most of what you do is revision. After you write your first draft, you give it to your editor and your editor writes a whole letter, uh, editorial note and says, I want to see more of this, less of that. What about this? Can you develop this more? I wasn't convinced by this. I was confused by that, you know, all kinds of feedback. And then you go through a whole another draft and then you give it to your editor. And then they come back with another letter like that and you revise it again. And then the um, book that you wrote gets sent to a copy editor and the copy editor has feedback for you too. So. You get a book before the book comes out, it goes through, you know, four or five different versions. 
and sometimes more. I mean, I, I've heard of, I have friends who are authors who sometimes have to like rewrite a book <laughs> from scratch. Um, it can be a long process. And the good thing about it is that it takes the pressure off you because you realize that you're going to have plenty of opportunity to work on your book. And that's in a way I think, maybe I'm crazy, but I think that's the fun part. I love it when I get the editorial feedback and revise because I can tell that the book is getting better. And the worst feeling in the world is when, and I've had this happen to me a couple of times, when your editor says, no, it's fine. <laughs> from the beginning and you think it can't be fine what does that mean it's fine <laughs> you know you want when if you're if you're a real writer you want the criticism because that means you're playing on the same team and you're you're all invested in making the book the best it can be how do you not take that personally because i know kids take criticism personally a lot like they i know they have a hard time being told that something isn't perfect i know how, i know how do you get past that I don't know. <laughs> I think I think if you you if you hear it enough, you realize that you know the idea is not to criticize Adam Chang or Dominic. It's to make the work as good as it can be. It's not a personal attack. It's all about developing what you did so that it's it's the best it can be. So. I, I, I never take it personally when my editor comes to me and, and gives me, you know, what I do take personally is if I hear, oh, it's fine. Don't, <laughs> there's nothing you can, then I think like, do you care? Have you even read it? <laughs> fine. <laughs> Did you scan? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I had, I had an editor very early on who um, said to me, it's fine, you know, I'm, I'm ready to go with it. And I, I just freaked me out because I just thought, did you read it? You know? <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a really scary feeling because you feel like you're just being put out in public without, you know, just wearing your underwear. <laughs> <laughs> that's you, don't want, you, you don't want to feel that way. No, no one wants that. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Lauren wants to know if you ever go to bookstores and see what other authors are writing about or what they're not writing about. Oh, yeah. And libraries all the time. I mean, that's that's like, as I said, that's like what I do. I'm, I'm trying to write books that other people aren't writing. So you have to know what other people are writing and you have to not just see them on the shelves. You have to actually read them because sometimes, you know, there are people who are writing about the same topics but they're doing it in a completely different way, coming at it from a completely different angle. So it doesn't mean that you can't write your book. You know, it's cool that different authors are writing about the same topic in very, very different ways. So I know um, when my book Violets Are Blue is coming out in September, um, Dusty Bowling is, has a book on the same topic, but it couldn't be more different from Violets are Blue. They're like night and day. And so it's going to be interesting to see the way two different authors treat the same topic completely differently. Um, yeah. You know, yeah, I wouldn't not, I wouldn't not write a topic because somebody wrote it as long as, you know, I knew that I was writing about it in a very, very different way. So, yeah. Um, Camila wanted to know if it's hard writing all these books. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's my answer. Yeah. Yes. It's I think very, that's very, it's a very, it's a very hard career. It really is. Not only the writing, the writing is hard and I'm not going to suggest anything other than that. It is very hard. Um, you know, before you get published, you're getting rejected a lot. And then after you get published, you get criticized. So there's rejection and there's criticism afterwards. And it's, you know, you have to be tough. Um, and then of course you have to do a lot of um, publicizing of your book. You know, you have to do a lot of public speaking and mm -hmm. this is easy, this is fun. I love meeting with kids and, and chatting with kids. This is not hard, but I've also done like keynote addresses in front of auditoriums and stuff like that. And that's, you know, if, if what you do all day is, is sit and type, 
you know, and hide behind your computer. And all of a sudden now you're in public and you're behind a microphone and stuff. That can be a little unnerving. You have to get used to it. You know, I'm used to it now. But when I when it first started happening, um, it was scary. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have a question specific to maybe he just likes you from Xenia, who's uh -huh. actually reading that book right now. Um, What's her name Zenia? Zenia. Oh, Zenia. I thought because in my life in the in my life in the fish tank, the main character is Zenia. Yeah, no, very close, but no. Yes. Um, okay. she wants to know why the teacher chose Callum to be section leader. Was it because he was louder than the other trumpet musicians? Of course, the teacher didn't choose that. Barbara D chose that. It's just... <laughs> I will tell you guys a secret. This is that teacher and the way she played favorite was based on the teacher that my kids had. Uh, um, don't tell anybody. <laughs> but this was a teacher who um, was the uh, orchestra teacher when my kids were in orchestra and she played favorite and she especially liked the boys and she made them all section leaders and my kids had a hard time with that. They felt like they were being overlooked and, you know, teachers are people and sometimes they do stuff like that. But I think Miss Fender, you know, by the end of the book, I don't know. I, I mean, I know that she she's changed a lot and she realizes a lot and she respects Mila and um, is really disappointed in Callum and she gets it by the end. But at the beginning, she was just only thinking about the band and how people sounded. And, you know, she wasn't really thinking about the kids and, and their feelings so much. So she grows too. I always like it when um, characters grow over the course of the book, the main characters especially. But I think I think she grows too. So yeah, she was she was based on this one teacher. I have to say, <laughs> but don't tell anybody. <laughs> I wonder if they ever recognize themselves. Occasionally, I I have people um, based on people I know, but. I don't do that a whole lot. Yeah. Um, Mr. Cornfine is here. Hi, Mr. K. <laughs> He's an English teacher at the other school. Hey. <laughs> Hello. Thank you for being here. I just had a question that you were talking about, you know, as a writer, you have to kind of read a lot of other people's books and just wanted to know what your influence, like what were some of your favorite authors or books that influenced your writing or influenced you? Do you mean when I was growing up? Yeah. Well, one book that I was obsessed with when I was a kid, it was Harriet the Spy. Oh, I love that book. <laughs> the kids, are kids still reading Harriet the Spy? I don't oh, know. I loved it though. I read it like 14 times, I think. That was my book. Yeah, I did read it like 14 times. I, I was a huge reader. I was the kind of kid who would be, you know, brushing my teeth and reading at the same time, you know, and my mom was always saying, stop reading. <laughs> Uh, but I think my favorite book was um, uh, Harriet the Spy. I also loved um, um, A Tree Grows in Brooklyn, which is a book I don't know if kids are still reading. It's, it's, it might be very dated. Mm. Yeah, I love that book. Um, I, I was the kind of kid who was constantly reading and then I sort of hit a wall in middle school because there really weren't books for me which is one of the reasons I'm writing books now for this age group quite frankly um, I you know I read so much when I was in those elementary years and then I hit seventh grade sixth grade seventh grade certainly eighth grade I felt like you know that we didn't have a lot of YA books and the kid books I'd outgrown and there just was like a sweet spot that just was not being met. Um, and I just, I struggled for a few years there and I didn't know what to read. And I remember reading when I was, I guess in like seventh grade, I read Catcher in the Rye and I loved the voice, but a lot of it, I didn't get, it just went over my head and it was not, <laughs> it was just not, you know. We're like book twins, Barbara, you're naming all the things I did exactly the same. like. Well, what am I going to read now? I read everything for elementary school and now I move into adult books because there's nothing else. Yeah, because yeah. there, there were books in this, mm -hmm. up, uh, well, my, I consider my books upper middle grade because they're like 
they're not for age eight to 12. They're more like nine or 10, maybe 10 to 14. There's mm -hmm. like that pre YA um, 13. Yeah, that pre YA kind of group. They want to read about stuff that, that, you know, reflects their experience that they care about. Um, that they think is cool, you know, um, but it has to also be entertaining and, you know, um, age appropriate. So, I mean, that's my thing to write for this group, because I know that when I was that age, I didn't have, I ran out of books. And I saw the same thing happen to my own kids a few years ago. Um, and my son, I have two boys and a, and a girl, my two sons um, started reading a lot of science fiction and um, a lot of like dystopian stuff and science fiction. Um, but my daughter wanted to read realistic stuff and she, there were no books that were that right kind of combination for her when she was that age. So that's, that's when I started writing. Yeah. There's a bunch of people yeah. popping up. Uh, let's see. Um, Natalie says that as she's been listening, she's realizing a lot of your books are about personal experiences but for times you write from a different point of view that are challenges. I think there's typos in here. You write from a different point of view that are challenges. I don't, I don't, Natalie, can you clarify your question for me? Yeah, it was a little hard for me to like type it, but um, yeah. so most of your experiences are like personal, but when you do have to write from a middle school, like a middle schooler's point of view, and you're like not in middle school. Um, like, how do you make it sound so like nicely and or like nice and flowy and not like you're writing an article and like statistics or something? <laughs> <laughs> well, I would, I would never do that. <laughs> Absolutely not. Um, I don't know. I mean, that's that's like the single most important thing in writing a book for this age group is getting the voice right I think that's that's the whole ball game if you if you can't write like a kid if you don't sound authentically kid-like if you sound like a, a middle-aged woman mm -hmm. peace out it's, it's over yep <laughs> and you know and I I'll, I'll be honest with you I, I read books sometimes for this age group and um, I'll stop reading after a few pages because I could tell that the voice is just not right and I'm just not buying it. It sounds like a book is being written by a grown-up in the first person as a kid and it's it's not working. So that's the most important thing. If you, if you, if you can't get that voice down, write something else. And I, you know, I do a lot of um, listening. I do a lot of eavesdropping. I, I listen to how kids speak and grownups because kids and grownups need to sound different from each other in a book, right? Kids need to sound like kids. Grownups need to sound like grownups. Um, and they can't all sound the same. You have to listen to stuff like um, the kinds of words that somebody uses, the kinds of emphasis. Do they end their sentences with question marks? Do they end their sentences dot, dot, dot? Do they end their sentence with exclamation points? Um, you know, do they interrupt each other? Do they allow themselves to be interrupted? All of these things go into creating a voice and you have to have a different voice for different characters. So, you know, that's one of the reasons that, as I said before, I like to read my stuff out loud because that helps you make sure both that your voice is authentic and also that your characters don't all sound the same. I think you do that very well. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. There's, when I read a book and, and all the characters have the same voice, those are the books I abandon too. I'm like, yeah, y'all sound the same. If you have to put your name as the chapter title and you're switching points of view, then you, you lost me. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I think you're good at that. Um, Cruz, if you guys want to ask your own questions, just raise your hand. You are welcome to talk. Um, Cruz wants to know how long it usually takes for you to write a book. It can really vary. As I was saying before, it really depends on the revision process. Um, you know, maybe he just likes you and, and Starcross were super fast to write. Um, Starcross was really fast because it's based on Romeo and Juliet and it goes chapter by chapter paralleling um, the action in Romeo and Juliet. So I used Romeo and Juliet as my outline. And so that made it really easy to write. <laughs> 
<laughs> and I wrote that one really fast. So that was, you know, I don't know, something like three months, maybe. That's really crazy fast. But the fastest book I ever wrote was maybe He Just Likes You. And um, that was just maybe I wrote the first draft of that in something like six weeks, which is insane. Oh. Nobody writes that fast. That's really ridiculous. Um, and Halfway Normal was pretty fast, too. Um, the book that I'm working on now, the one about climate change, um, I had to do a whole lot of scientific research for that. So that took a while. And if you have a career, you, you're you editing one book while you're writing the first draft of another and also researching another book. So you have to put stuff down and pick stuff up. And sometimes it's, you lose track of like how much time you're, you're spending on a book. So it can be like the whole process can be something like, you know, nine months, but it's not like you're working every day on the same project. You're picking stuff up and putting it down. And then you go through the revision process and that will be another few months, especially if you have a second round, a third round of revisions that you're doing. So it, it can, um, hello, who's coming in here? It's a cat. Um, <laughs> I have a cat and a dog and they both interrupt a lot. Um, so <laughs> uh, it, can, um, it can, it really varies completely. Um, there's no one answer. And one thing, you know, sometimes you feel as if I'm closing the door because she's annoying me. Um, <laughs> sorry if I was distracted there. Um, it's not like you have one way of working and you figure it out and you think, okay, I know I'm the kind of writer who takes six months to write a first draft. Every book is different. It's a different process every time. And you just have to sort of listen to the book and, and do what it needs. And if it needs more thinking, um, if it needs more research, whatever it is, you just have to go with it. Camille wants to know um, how you come up with your titles. Uh, and, the titles. That's, that's often <laughs> if you come up with your titles, right? <laughs> the title, that's like the hardest thing for me is the title. For Maybe He Just Likes You, I had the title before I started writing the book. Um, and that was great because it really helped me focus like what the story was going to be about. I just had that expression in my head and I knew that's that's the story for other books you come up with a title after you turn in your first your, your first draft and you had another title the whole time and you were thinking of it that's what the title of the book is and then your editor says uh, I'm not sure this title is going to lend itself to cover art which is what happened with my life in a fish tank mm -hmm. um, could you possibly think of another title? And then you go crazy because you'd always been thinking of this book having a different title. And it's like taking away somebody's name, you know, and saying from now on, you're gonna have a different name. You know, it's, and I drive my family crazy when, when I have to come up with a title after I've written the whole book. Um, it's awful. <laughs> it, are, are there any of your books that aren't your title that someone else titled them for you? Because when I, when my class went with Dusty Bowling last year, she told us that Insignificant Events, The Life of a Cactus was not her title. Someone else gave her that title. They said, no, here's what your title is going to be. And she was like, all right, that's my title. <laughs> that's, I'm, I have to tell Dusty that I think that's <laughs> terrible. <laughs> I would not, I would not be happy about that. A title is just, you know, it's, it's the most, you know, it, it's not the most important thing, but it is the characterization of your work and that has to come from you. There are times like with um, everything I know about you where um, I had to work on the title with my editor back and forth. What do you think about this? What do you think about that? But it was always ultimately my own choice. So I wouldn't, okay. I wouldn't be, happy. yeah. Uh, my first book, Just Another Day in My Insanely Real Life, which has a title like Insignificant Lives in, um, in, in, in I can't even say the, the It's so long. Too, there's too many words, just like Just Another Day is too many words. And that one was um, suggested by my first, very, very first editor. Um, I don't, I wouldn't have a title like that now. What was your original title for Fish Tank? It was originally called How to Survive Quicksand. Oh. Yeah. But Did I read that somewhere? Did you have that out there somewhere in the world? I feel like I've heard it that. It might have been. Yeah. 
Um, Cause you know, if you've read the book, you know, you understand yeah. why it was called that. Um, and that, and I thought of it as, you know, that's the title. And uh -huh. I, the short version of the title when I was writing back and forth to my editor was quicksand, you know, and um, I thought of that book as quicksand. But then they said, you know, we can't come up with a cover for that, with that title, How to Survive Quicks. And also, it doesn't really sound like a novel necessarily. It's like people won't be able to tell what it is and what if it gets mischaracterized on Amazon or, and I, st at first I thought, no, the title is Quicks. And then the more I thought about it, the more I thought, you know what, they're right. And I, I the cover art is so important. And um, when I thought, what would make a good cover art that would just be, you know, appealing and um, kind of mysterious, I thought of the fish tank image, because that's another image in the book that's very important to the story. It's not like I, you know, imported something that had nothing to do with the story. It's in the book. Um, in a way, it's even more significant than the quicksand thing. Um, so when I thought of my life in the fish tank, they came back with a cover and immediately I thought that was the right title. I'm so glad I listened to them. See, that's an example of listening to your editor. <laughs> now that cover's beautiful. Right, she you're getting, right. You're getting some compliments. Your titles are great, Zenia said. And Lauren says it's kind of the eye catcher, which it is. Kids like covers. Yeah. Um, Who is your favorite author right now? Cynthia wants to know. Besides you, besides yourself, she said. <laughs> I would never say myself. Um, <laughs> I, I love Kimberly Brubaker Bradley. Um, She's great. She's become a friend of mine, and I'm so honored. Um, but I think she's really great. I love Fighting Words. Do you have that in your in your classroom? I think so. Yeah, yeah. I do. Yeah. <laughs> It was just named, named a, a Newberry um, honor book. Mm. So yeah, I think she's great. Yeah, my library is really split YA and middle grade. So um, I have a lot of YA. I also love um, Paula Chase. Oh yeah, she's I also love her stuff. Of mine. And she's a great author in that, that sweet spot between middle grade and YA. You know, yeah. she's, she's really very much an upper middle grade author who you know just has such a great ear and writes such great dialogue and yeah you know, just yeah. has such an authentic voice so yeah, yeah. i like her stuff um, yeah. zenia has two questions here um one was have you ever published a book and then found a typo in it later on yes yes <laughs> yes yes okay yes, yes. and which book was it now <laughs> um uh, i think it was probably my first book yeah uh, just another day I yeah and also with with those early books sometimes I look at them and I think like uh, you know why did I choose that word it's it's hard to look back <laughs> I'm more confident about my more my more recent books quite honestly and that she had a second question was um if uh you know, which, which of your books do you take the most pride in? And maybe like, if you had to read one of your books, which one would it be? If you had to tell these guys out here, which one should they read? Oh, that's that's a tough choice. Yeah. You know, as I said, My Life in the Fish Tank, I'm, I'm, I'm very connected with. I, I'm very proud of that book. Mm -hmm. um, I'd probably say that one right now, yeah. but you know. It depends what you're interested in, what you're thinking about, what you're, you know, the kind of experience you want to have. Um, but that's what I like about your books is that you different. cover so many great topics that when there's a kid that's, that's looking for something specific, I can almost always pull one of your books, almost always. That's great. Which is great. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. fantastic. I have a whole Barbara D box in my classroom. <laughs> I've never been in a box before that. <laughs> because I don't have room for them all on the shelves because I've got a dozen copies of everything on your screen except for My Life in the Fish Tank. That one I'm waiting on to a lower How do you place. get, how are you getting books into kids' hands? This remotely? year, we do, we do yeah. pickups every two weeks. So I've digitized my library so they can make requests. And then right now they had to pick two books um, from a selection that dealt with social justice based on whatever topic they chose. So like, the kids that chose LGBTQ star crossed was in that selection. Whereas yeah. everything I know about you and halfway normal, I had as book club selections for the first round when we did narrative writing 
um, just because they're good stories and I just wanted them to read good story. So, mm -hmm. yeah, but yeah, we're able to get books to them every two weeks, which is great. It's not, it's, yes. I mean, it's not like normal. Normally I have kids that don't stop reading and this year. Well, that's what I'm worried about, you know, with, with right now is that kids aren't going to have enough access to books. Yeah. It's rough. It's rough. Yeah, but I go into the classroom every couple of weeks and pull books and we bag them. And then when they come back in, I let them sit before I reshelve them, so. Great. Yeah. Because yeah. reading is gonna help everybody get through this time, really. That's how you're gonna connect with people Yeah. by reading about characters. Yeah. What's the last book you read? The last book I read? Uh. Well, I have, um, I have Barack Obama's um, memoir mm -hmm. I just got. So I've been reading that. Um, yeah, that's the last book. Yeah. I just I like to read King, memoirs, King and the Dragonfly last night. Ah. Oh, my head is still reeling. I'm like, oh, okay, I need to take a little book vacation for a couple of days so I can just. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good feeling though. That's good. Yeah, yeah. All right, anybody else have questions? Anything else you wanna know? How'd you find the right editor and illustrator for you? Well, um, you have an agent and your agent sends your book around and um, then you form a relationship with an editor the editor who wants to publish one of your books and then you keep working with that person um you know it's possible to walk away from that relationship if you're not happy with it you're not stuck but you know it's it's very i, I have a relationship with my editor now where they're um happy to write me a, a contract for a book i haven't even written yet so I wouldn't give that up. That's really a, an amazing thing and unusual. And as far as the illustrator, um, your publisher picks the illustrator for the cover. But again, you know, this is a very relationshipy kind of industry. And um, the artist who did the cover for Maybe He Just Likes You. Um, and I love that cover. I think that's mm -hmm. a spectacular cover. Um, they knew that I was really happy with it and they um, hired her to do the cover for my new book, Violets Are Blue. Um, and the artist who did the cover for My Life in the Fish Tank is also the same artist who did the cover for Halfway Normal. So, you know, a lot of times you get to work with the same person as a, who's, you know, the, the cover artist. Um. This is an interesting question. If you had to get rid of one of your books forever, which one would you get rid of? <laughs> it's kind of a dark uh, question. <laughs> yeah, really. Why would I do that? I, I don't know. I can't answer that. No, <laughs> that's fair. <laughs> kind of dark. <laughs> Middle school, they can be dark. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate that. I've, I've got one. Um, Dominic wants to know. Um, how do you think of your ideas? What are some of your brainstorm or how do you, where do you, where do you pick them out of? Uh, well, you know, as I was saying before, some of it comes from the news. Some of it comes from thinking about stuff that happened to me or to my family. Some of it comes from, you know, just listening to people and, and, you know, hearing what teachers are saying or what kids are saying, or, you know, um, I had a, a, a friend who I used to, we used to walk dogs together, um, who was a child psychologist. And um, she was the one who um, got me thinking about having a, a story about a kid whose older sibling had a mental illness and that became my life in the fish tank. Um, you know, so it, it comes from all over the place, you know, it, it's not like, there's an idea store and you <laughs> put some money in a vending machine and out comes an idea. You just have to always be. That would be nice. Wouldn't yeah. it? <laughs> Kira, Kira has a question that kind of relates to that. And I love this question. Kira wants to know, how do you deal with the ideas that come in the middle of the night? 
<laughs> oh, those are the worst. Because <laughs> you think, oh, this is so great. I'm never going to forget it. And then you wake up and you think, like, what was the idea? <laughs> and it was so great. <laughs> and I know some people keep a pad next to their bed and they, they write down those middle of the night ideas. But then in the morning, they can't read their handwriting. <laughs> so it's, I don't know. That's, that's tough. Although I have to say that I do have ideas in the middle of the night about things that I've written, like realizations why a, a chapter is just not working. And um, sometimes I do remember when I wake up the next morning. Yeah, problem that's, solving. That's, yeah. Subconscious yeah. problem solving is great. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's not so much like I have an idea in the middle of the night. Um, oh, I know what, what you know, the next chapter can be better. It's more like, oh, I know why that didn't work. Yeah. And then that's great. And then I can fix it. Um, and then Cruz wants to know which book was the most fun to write? Starcrossed. Starcrossed? Oh. Yeah. I love Star Both because, as I said, you know, it's based on Romeo and Juliet. And it, um, I went scene by scene in Romeo and Juliet. So, I had something to play with, but also because the book is intended to be positive and fun and funny. And it's, you know, it's about a very serious topic, your, your sexual identity, but it's, it's meant to be um, affirming and positive and, and happy. So it was just a very joyful experience writing that book. Definitely awesome. the most fun. <laughs> All right, anybody else have a question? Or did I miss one? Because sometimes they scroll too fast. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna unmute everyone so that you can all give Barbara a big hand. Let's see. I think there's a way to do that. Isn't there a way to unmute everyone at the same time? All right, unmute yourselves and give Barbara a big round of applause. And thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you for spending time with us. Thank you. Thank you. Look, <laughs> oh, there's people there. <laughs> Welcome to our world. <laughs> All right. Thanks for thanks for doing this. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Maybe yeah. We can do it again in in um, next year. Yeah, definitely. In the classroom again. Yay. Yay. I hope so. <laughs> I hope so too. <laughs> right. I'm sure you do. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Barbara. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Stay you safe, too. everybody. Thanks, you too. Bye. Bye.